to be here. I love green light. Thank you, green light. I can't name every single one of you, but um, you know, you guys know I love this bookstore. So, and I just want to say quickly, thank you to my. I don't know. I have a huge team. Rakia Clark is my editor. My agent Jackie Co. Christy Murray. Uh, Bonnie, like everybody, I have such an amazing team. It's been such a wonderful experience, and I will now go into the book because I know that that's why you're here. Um, <laughs> so Harry Sylvester Bird. Um, let's see, what shall I say? Yeah, everything they said is correct. It's quite provocative. It's a ride. I hope you enjoy the ride, and I think you will, but you have to be in the right mood. Um, so I'll just, I think I'll just put that out. So I'll read two excerpts for you, um, just a, a little bit from the beginning, and then a little more from a little bit farther into the beginning of the novel. So chapter one. We arrived at the resort in the afternoon when the sun was rising above the army of palm trees, lined and fanning in the breeze like windmills in the brightening orange and blue. Chevrolet and Wayne, I refused to call them mom and dad, had remained silent for the 45-minute drive from the airport except for brief responses to the white-capped, white-gowned driver such as when the driver asked if they'd be needing Wi-Fi access, and they both nodded and said yes and thank you at once. In the spirit of solidarity, I nodded too. But the signal had been weak and the connection elusive, and soon Wade and Chevy leaned onto their separate windows, eye in the middle, and zoned out as if they were sleeping with their eyes open. When the driver pulled up to the resort's gate, the Maasai warrior, with his red and pink shuka, his cowhide sandals, and his wooden club, rose from his bamboo stool and inspected our car before leaving us in. All in an instant, the resort emerged before us like a tropical paradise. Behold, before my eyes, conical patched with teeth, flanked by the green front of the palm trees, white hammocks dangling between the stems, gold-trimmed lounge chairs, with rolling arms and claw foots, wide beamed umbrellas, and in every direction, lush and low-lying tulip and hibiscus bushes. Wayne and Chevy had fought on the plane and before getting on the plane, and before that, and I had begun to think that perhaps for once they had grown satiated with their fighting for the day. But as we stepped out of the cab, a new fight materialized. The taxi service had been included in the booking, but who would pay for the tip? And how much to tip? I was only 14 and without any income other than the occasional allowance, but knowing them, they would have had me pay if they thought I could have somehow managed it. So just this chapter is giving you a little bit of a hint as to the parents that created our auditorium, <laughs> Harry Sylvester Bird. Um, my stomach nodded with the bickering. Palms Sweaty, head still and loose. As if the car sickness were not enough, now this fight. Wayne said, Honey, it's Africa. One dollar is enough for a year's living. You don't need to give them more than that. Fine, I'll get it this time. But it was nearly an hour drive, Chevy said. I don't see what giving five dollars will hurt. In the end, they settled on two dollars. Two years' income, Wayne said, for less than an hour's drive. Chevy narrowed her eyes at him, then walked away, dragging her luggage along. I followed Chevy. Of the two, she was the one to follow. Wayne often erred too far on the side of harshness, of cruelty. Treat others the way you would not like to be treated, it seemed to me was his motto. No golden rule for him. With Chevy, at least sometimes there were surprises. As I rolled my luggage away, I heard the driver softly say, Asante. And maybe the driver truly was grateful, gratitude in principle and by practice. I knew a bit about that. This was late December, and our Christmas tree had been an oversized mother-in-law's tongue in a tall maroon urn. It was a house plant that we'd owned for the preceding half decade. Wayne had insisted it was the perfect segue into our safari trip. Chevy had insisted that Christmas was its own event and deserved its own tree. Why spend the money after he had doled out so much on the impending trip, Wayne had asked. 
well, Shetty answered. We laid our three gifts under the plant. My Christmas gift from them had been a nail clipper wrapped in an empty matchbox. <laughs> Nothing to brag about. Still, I had made a practice of gratitude, a notion that I had stumbled upon on the internet. And so I was grateful for the gift. And after all, nails grew and would always need clipping. Maybe this was how the driver saw it too, a practical sort of gratitude. So that's the opening of um, Harry Sylvester Bird. Um, and we go on to find out more about the parents, but also um, Harry's relationship with his parents. Um, they go on to actually be in the safari. Um, and I'll read this following section where you get to you know, see, especially Way, uh, Wayne, you get to see Wayne, who is uh, Harry's father. You get to see him a little bit better. Um, and it's not good. <laughs> so that's okay for me. It happens. Outside, the stars sprinkle the sky like grains of salt. The air smelled crisp like an open freezer, or like that gap in seasons between the Pennsylvania fall and winter. At Camp TV, the oily scent of the triangular snacks that looked like spinacopita drifted in the air. I grabbed a handful of them, then found a spot by two empty chairs at the edge of the camp TV setup. The food had a kick to it, and some heat, like the swelter of a McDonald's or Burger King spicy crispy chicken sandwich, except more. More pepper, more fire, an African twist, I suppose. The voices rose and fell as the hosts took drink orders. The food was causing me to sweat a little. I asked for a glass of water, glancing around in search of Benson, but he was nowhere to be seen. My aunt, my eyes, sorry, landed on my parents just as I placed my order. It was the anarchy of Wayne's mannerisms, like a body and a mind at war with each other that caught my attention. He had clearly had too much to drink. Chevy sat rigidly like a block of ice refusing to melt. I devoured the order, especially the Spanakopita, despite its heat. After some time, I decided that I was sufficiently full and that I should head back to bed and try my best to forget about what I just witnessed. I might, of course, have stayed if the darkest man had been there. I would have loved nothing more than to be in his presence, the way people crave to be in the presence of their heroes the way we all crave to be in the presence of our aspirational selves. But alas, Benson was not there. All I needed now was that glass of water. I'd hardly risen from my seat when Wayne's voice came. Young lady, I said, could I have another beer? There was a silence before a camp host, a bald young man approached with a beer on a tray. Wayne refused the server's beer Young lady, I said, I'd like another beer. The young woman whom Ray was addressing now turned to face him. Sir, I've told you before, I don't walk at the camp. Near her sat another young woman. They looked vaguely, vaguely alike. They must have been about around the same age in their early or mid-twenties, old enough to be the ages of any of the younger teachers in my school. Say this Rice, but not old enough to be the age of Mrs. Smith, the school librarian, and certainly not old enough to be my parents ages. Where are you from? Wayne asked. I shook my head in horror. We're from Ghana, the second young woman said. Ghana? Wayne asked. Yes, the woman said at once, seeming amused. Why are you here if you're from Africa? Excuse me? The first woman asked in what appeared to be an honestly inquisitive sort of way. For a moment, I thought that perhaps she had really not heard the question. I said, why are you here if you're from Africa? Wayne repeated. Ah, I see, the woman said. Probably the same reason you're here, to see the animals, to experience the beauty of Serengeti. But you're African, Wayne said. Sir, can I offer you this beer now? The Kampanala host asked. A safari is only to be enjoyed by non-Africans, the second black young woman asked. 
but you can see for yourself, Wayne said, extending his hand in an expansive way as if to show the audience to her. You're the only black guests here. Oh, Chale, the first black young woman said, pardon me, it must have been written somewhere in the book of life that safaris are to be enjoyed only by whites, yeah? The beauty of Africa is something to be experienced by white people in the Please, sir, uh, the host begged, take your beer. The first black young woman stood up at her friend's urging. Together, they walked away from Wayne until they reached the area on the edge of the camp where I sat, cringing, my thighs so stiffly joined together that they ached. The first woman's body seemed made of prickly things. She shook herself off as if to dislodge some pesky birds. So agitated was she by the whole incident. It's all right, the second woman was saying. He's drunk. He doesn't know what he's saying. He knows exactly what he's saying, the first woman said. After a while, the first woman seemed to have calmed down, and then her eyes went on me. Oh, she said, I didn't realize you were there. Yeah, I couldn't. What's your name? She asked. I'm Esme, and this is my sister, Nanama. The second woman said, smiling. I'm Harry, I said. You're not here by yourself, are you? Esme asked. Yeah, I said, pointing dejectedly to my parents. Those are my folks. Ah, Nanama said, poor thing. She exclaimed softly, almost in a whisper. <laughs> Now, Chandler and I have been friends for a long time, but Chandler doesn't tell me a damn thing about anything <laughs> that she's working on. So I knew what this book was about when I got the galley and I read it. <laughs> and, and it was a delight. I think the first thing to start with is that it's very obviously a different style from what you usually write. And when I first asked you, like, oh, what is it? And you were like, well, you know, it's a satire of white liberalism. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's delightful. <laughs> um, what made you, like, switch? And what was it like to switch from the style of fiction to something like this? So, you know, it is, it's different from what I've written to an extent. But the truth is, it's, it's not actually that different from, you know, some of the things that I've written. If you've read Happiness Like Water, you've read like the collection, um, I don't remember the names of my own stories, but there's a story in there that has a woman who is trying to get pregnant, and that is kind of like a satirical short story. Everybody loves it. It was published in conjunctions. I don't remember, I really don't remember it. Does anybody know the name of that story? <laughs> story, story, oh my gosh, why would I forget it? Who said that? Oh, oh, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so, so yeah, so Ray loves that story. Um, it, it's, a, it's kind of a like heavy satire story, very serious, but also kind of hilarious. But you have to kind of get my humor, but also the humor of the story and the society in which the story is functioning, right? Um, so, for instance, one of the blurbers of that, no of, of that collection was Chika Onigwe. And she said to me, this is a hilarious collection, but it all, you know, humor doesn't always translate internationally, nationally, whatever. Um, it's a very sort of, um, you know, tricky thing to negotiate. But that being said, satire is not completely new to me. It's actually a thing that I've studied. Um, I got my master's in the 17th and 18th century um, British literature, so the Restoration Era, which is heavy on satire and sexual explicitness. Charles II was the king at the time, and he was very encouraging of like freedom, liberty, and um, you know playfulness in the arts. So I read and studied a lot of satirical novels, and also um, 
well, I'll just stick with the satirical part of things now. But I, I read, you know, um, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, for instance. Um, and I also studied French almost at the same time, well, also prior to my master's. So I was also reading books like Voltaire's Candide, which is also satirical, right? It's a social criticism that is like heavy-handed, um, sort of, you know, making a point in its heavy-handedness. And then, obviously, we, we go down, I study things down to contemporary um, satirical novels. So you've all read things like, uh, books like Animal Farm. You've all probably read Slaughterhouse-Five. You know, those are all satirical novels. Um, Slaughterhouse-Five is a criticism of war. You know, um, Animal Farm is a criticism of um, the regime, you know, what's going on at the time. And then we, we have, you love um, Fred Ross's Oreo, which is also satirical. We've got Nana Kwame wrote Friday Black. I always want to say Black Friday, but Friday Black. <laughs> um, that's also satirical. There are many satirical novels. You've probably watched the TV, The Simpsons. That's satirical. Um, there are lots of satirical sort of shows. But um, I think what's difficult for some people when they see a book like this is that um, it's playing with the gaze a lot. And we're having to combat stereotypes that we have, right? Because there is a stereotype that we hold for what an African woman should write, right? I should write like African women, like kind of soft stories to an extent. Um, African women struggles. Um, I'm confined to certain um, subject areas, and uh, you know it's a pigeon pigeonholing that I'm you know sort of saying. Well, I actually de deserve the freedom to write more openly, to write more creatively beyond those confines of what society expects of of certain demographics. Right? And so that's what this book is. And I didn't do it just to make a point. I did it because it was like sort of a calling for me. And um, so I'll stop there with this answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you were talking, one question just stuck in my mind was like, did it feel playful? as you're writing it? Like, did you have fun with it? Did it make you laugh? Like, was there a lightheartedness despite, you know, the subject matter and the case that you're flipping? Yeah, yeah. It was very painful to write, actually. It was painful to write, but it was also very funny, right? So Harry is actually, so if we will erase a little bit these notions of political correctness that we have, which serve us, very well in certain circumstances, but in some ways can, can make us a little too sort of um, binary, too um, like either right or wrong. If we can erase some of that, I think we can see the humor in, in Harry's behavior. Harry is a mess, and it is okay because like that's what we all are. We're humans, right? That's our job, like to be a mess, right? Um, and. He's a royal mess, but there are moments of like, there's, he's quite an empathetic character if you care to see that, if you're not stuck on like, oh my gosh, why would he do that? Because like, that's just not right because of political correctness, right? Um, now, Harry is a person who is so anti what his parents are, and we can't blame him, that he hyper-corrects. And he becomes almost as offensive, or in some cases, more offensive than the parents, um, which is the point. Right. Yeah, I, I thought he was hilarious. Like, I laughed a lot reading the book because I thought that, you know, this book was poking fun at so many things. But also, this type of white guy, like, I was actually telling one of my friends about the book because I was like, you know this person. I was like, you've met this dude. Like, so he goes on a date in the book. It's a minor spoiler. We'll survive. We'll survive. Um, he goes on a date in the book with a Nigerian girl, and the first question he asks her is, what are you doing to dismantle white supremacy? <laughs> <laughs> and I died laughing because I was like, I've had friends, I mean, not personally, but I've had friends who, you know, who know that, like, you know, the super woke, like, overcorrecting person, and to see that person written like this, and to see the way it's shown and poked fun at, was 
uh, an immense pleasure for me. <laughs> for you, what was it like to write, like to write this character, but to write it from the first person? So to like slip inside the skin of this this character. Like when I first read the book, I was just like, oh, we're going there. We're just <laughs> writing fully, like embodying this this person, which I thought was again like a very provocative choice, but. I guess provocative to certain people. Yeah. But for me, it was uh, it was decisive. It was like I'm stepping into this in order to show you this. But what was it like, you know, as you wrote it? Yeah. Thank you for that question. And I, uh, you know, it's just exactly as you said. Like the humor will be obvious to certain demographics, right? To certain people, they'll get it, and then it won't be. You know, so obvious. It just depends on who you are, where you're coming from, and I hate to. I don't want to say too much more in that, but uh, into that. But I will say that um, the is well, there are little moments of inspiration, and you don't actually know when a book, like, what, what was that exact moment when you had the idea to write this book? I don't know what that exact moment was, but I can trace back. I can trace it back to a course that I was teaching actually here in New York City at Columbia University and it was a course on um, basically cultural appropriation, writing other cultures in fiction, right? And so we read books like The Help by Catherine Stockett, Adam Johnson's Orphan Master's Son, The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. We read um, Memoirs of a Geisha, right? Arthur Golding. Some people after my event in Philadelphia mentioned to me that they didn't actually know that Memoirs of a Geisha was not written, or that he, mm -hmm. they didn't know it was written by a white guy, you know? Um, because there's that preface that kind of tricks you, right? So there are all these books, works of literature historically, that have taken on the gaze of other cultures and have done amazingly well, right? One of the books that fascinates me, and I write about it, it's, it's a fascinating novel, actually two of them, but the author is um, William Styron. And I don't know if you guys have heard or read of William Styron, but he is the author of um, Confessions of Nat Turner and Sophie's Choice, right? Confessions of Nat Turner went on to win the Pulitzer Prize. Sophie's Choice did amazingly well, I don't know what prize, I don't remember, but movies made out of it, etc. But this is a man who decided that he wanted to write about a real life slave, right? A real life man um, who was fighting for his um, freedom from slavery, right? And when he wrote this novel, which won the Pulitzer Prize, he made this man to be basically a raging monster and a rapist, right? And he's a white guy, I hate to put it that way, and he got away with it, right? Like, he was, I mean, it stirred a lot of controversy, I'll say that. Um, you know, there was, a, the, there was a book in response to it, uh, Confessions of Nat Turner, 10 Black Writers Respond, and they talked about this idea of why change the biography of a real-life man making him, you know, lusting after a white, white woman which was never the case. His, like, the records show he was married to a black woman named Cheryl Hadid. He was happily married. But this novel that changed everything, right, based on a real life story, changed his biography, made him a raging monster, got you to sympathize with the white slavers because it then focused on the, you know, massacre of the white people of after the, um, you know, after the uh, slaves, these people wanted to fight, find their freedom from slavery. The empathy was then on the side of the massacred whites, right? But they won the Pulitzer. A lot of people loved it, right? The black community was like, why? <laughs> why? You know, and uh, Baldwin, we love Baldwin. Being the diplom dip diplomat, I should say that he is, was like, well, you can't, nobody can tell a writer what they can or cannot write. Of course, like, there were responses to that, like, Ozzie Davis was like, actually, if we have no discrimination anymore, then sure. But actually, there are consequences to doing, to writers writing certain, certain things um, if, you know, if we still have discrimination, prejudice, racism, etc. So the point of that long-winded response is to say <laughs> that there is a reason why a woman like me would decide that, you know what, I want to feel that 
power. I want to feel that privilege. I want to know what it's like to enjoy that. But I also took a risk, and I know it's a risk, and you all know it's a risk, because we live in a different time, but we also live in a time where I'm still aware that I'm a black woman. I am not, like, I bet you, well, I can tell you the books of white men and women who have written things from, about other cultures, and they're praised. I know that I wasn't going to be praised from the beginning because I'm just a lowly black woman, right? They're going to say, why are you writing this voice? Why are you doing this? You're jumping into somebody else's POV. You shouldn't do that. You're painting us negatively. But I'm not. He's fictional. He's a satirical <laughs> character. I was careful about that because I also know who I am in society. I'm just a black woman, supposedly, right? But I was going to enjoy that privilege, too, because that's how we rise, right? So I wanted just to see what it was like to write it without, I was afraid, but to try to write it without fear. Because I won't lie, it's a big project to take on. Um, but I jumped into his character. I was cautious, and I made it satirical. That's the first thing I did, just out of an abundance of caution. Which I <laughs> but I also made sure he wasn't based on a real life person so that I wasn't skewing anybody's real life narrative. And I, well, there, I won't talk about it, but I also made sure to um, create his identity in a way that made it so that I felt like I had a little bit of a right to write that African part of him because I am African, right? I'm, I identify as a woman, but like, I have that African part in me that, since he also identifies as African, I felt like I had a little bit more of um, a new way in, in, in entering the novel that way. So there were, you know, precautions that I had to take <laughs> because I'm still aware of who I am in society and I'm still aware of the kind of society we live in. You know, one of the things I loved about how you wrote him was that I did end up empathizing with him, and I was just like, oh, <laughs> um, because it was it was actually a really good depiction of what it's like when you're raised with a certain kind of privilege and you're raised with a certain kind of power. So there are moments in the book, so I'm not going to spoil them, but there are moments in the book where he is where he just like freezes up, right? Where he's just like, I, I don't I don't know what to do, and in that moment, of, uh, 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 violence happens to other people. And and I was like, oh, this is this is such a brilliant way to depict it because for someone who you know is a white cishet man who has so much power that even in even in that moment of uh, 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 and not being able to articulate things or just in that when you're in an interaction with a person of color that other person is at risk, like in so much danger from your silence, you know? And, and from Harry's point of view, it was just, it was innocuous. It was, I, I didn't know what to say. I, like, it was very human. But from a wider point, there was so much violence that was enacted on somebody else because of his silence. And, and I thought you did a, a brilliant job of showing you know, showing that um, and showing how how much responsibility there is with that kind of privilege because the costs are so much higher for other people, even if it's just like, you know, ineffectual blundering on your part, someone else is suffering for that and that is the way that the world we're in is, mm -hmm. you know, set up. Um, another thing I really loved about the book was the parts, well, I'll frame this as a question. So. You wrote this during the pandemic. How did that? Some of it. How did that? How did that weave its way into the book? So the pandemic. Well, so I started writing the book. Clearly, I started writing the book before the pandemic. Then the pandemic came and tried to mess up my plans. <laughs> and because the book goes on into the future, I I knew already. I was already creating a world that was sort of an alternate um, here and now. Yeah. So like it wasn't exactly our real, it wasn't a completely realist novel, right? I had this third party system, a third party, party uh, political system that was happening in the US. I had, um, you know, different areas in the US were not quite the way 
that they are now. Even New York City is not the way New York is right now. Right? There was a, a sort of, I was trying to create something a little bit alternate. Um, so when the pandemic hit, I was like, I, it's still close enough to reality that I want to like take um, the pandemic into a little bit of consideration, but then how will I skew it a little bit so that it is, a, you know, different from our reality as far as how the pandemic is affecting us all. So it affected Harry in a way that it affected a lot of us, but also there are systems in place in that alternate um, reality where that don't exist in our real world. So we have things like pandemic bubbles, we have things like a, a pandemic registry um, that don't exist in our real world. And I just wanted to also play around with that, you know, as slight reminders that it's not exactly our reality. It is really a satirical novel, right? So if you read a book like, I don't know, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, Gulliver is traveling through four different countries and seeing four different weird things happening. And in the end, Gulliver decides he hates humans, like he wants to be with the horses, whatever. But he's gone through, that's true. And I think it's brilliant. I wrote about him, but. <laughs> I think it's brilliant, but he goes to four different countries. Those are all just four different parts of England, you guys, right? So what you write, when you write a satire, you're just shifting reality a little bit or a lot, as much as you want, right? And, and that's kind of what happens with Harry. Ghana is not exactly the way I painted Ghana. Ghana is, Ghana is beautiful. First of all, like Ghana. Ghana is like the best. Let's get that straight. <laughs> yeah. But like you know, I took some liberties making Ghana kind of like amazing, like futuristic-ish, but not as like it's too. It's so the thing with Ghana is kind of like in the U.S. I hate to say it, it's heading in the direction of the novel in terms of it is technologically advanced with those biomethane buses in my novel. That's like a thing they're doing, but I I made them in the novel more focus on the earth, growth from the earth, and not necessarily like, you know, chemicals and all of that. So I was taking a few liberties with um, making it um, satirical, right? Making the world not exactly our world, but close enough um, to work with our world. I think y'all will love it. Like, I read it and I called it and I was just like, so when are we getting the sci-fi novel? Because it's giving dystopia. <laughs> and I want to read, you know, a world that. How are we on time? You're we good. good. You're good. All right. We're gonna do a Q and A in a bit. So start rustling up your questions, um, and you can ask about the other books as well. Can they? Sure. Yeah. Why not? Harry came out yesterday. Yeah. Not time to read it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about. Um, this thing you said once about the book being about inherited burdens, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could talk a little about that. Definitely. So I, that's it relates to one of the things you mentioned. Why Harry feels so sympathetic, right? Um, we, I actually think I love. I, so of course, any author loves when a person reads, when anybody, any reading audience reads and understands and sees the novel, sees the heart of what the novel is trying to be. So. Thank you, first of all, um, for seeing my work. But beyond that, it's lovely to see that you see Harry. You know, because again, like I said, these binary systems we have of like, he's good or he's bad, right? Harry is actually quite empathetic. And part of the reason why he is is because we get to see where Harry comes from, what he's reacting to, what burdens he's carrying, and how he's trying to flee those burdens. And really, Harry is just the person who gets stuck, right? And then the cycle repeats, because that's kind of what happens. Look at history, right? And then the cycle repeats. It just looks slightly different. And I'm not trying to be pessimistic, because I think that we are making progress, right? But like, like they always say, like I've learned to say, because I was sick for the last two years, and I was always reminded that healing is not linear, right? So we have these setbacks even historically, where this period might just be a little bit of a setback, but it doesn't mean we should lose hope. But the novel captures that setback, right? And that's just what novels do. Sometimes they capture the moments in history that are not the greatest, and sometimes they capture the greatest moments too, right? So, 
you know, to answer your question, like Harry feels the burdens of history. He feels the burdens of slavery. He feels the burdens um, of the kind of parents he has. And he grows up in a family that is actually quite abusive. So when you put all of that together, there are lots of reasons to sympathize, empathize with Harry, with a character like Harry. It doesn't mean he's great, it doesn't mean he's perfect. You know, who amongst us is like perfect and great and you know does it all right? But yeah, he's satirical, so his, his imperfections are overblown, right? For a purpose, because that's the genre, right? But I thought he was, you know, I wrote him to be quite empathetic. Even his really nasty parents, they have moments of vulnerability that I think, and I don't want to spoil it, but especially with Chevy, she's stuck in this terrible marriage. But then, I, want, I should read you that moment. It's not really a spoiler, but they're in this terrible marriage, but there's this beautiful scene. Well, I wrote it, so I shouldn't say that. <laughs> her love um, for somebody else and in a moment of just tenderness Wayne also who knows that this has been going on allows it to happen too like he doesn't fuss he doesn't um, try to like end it he doesn't get angry he lets her have her love you know like there are little moments where these people are actually kind of nice even if they kind of stink. <laughs> you know? um, but so in a book like that, it'd be nice for people to just see those little moments, even if, yes, they're kind of terrible. And the novel is relentless with that, because that's the point, you guys. But yeah. That is exactly the point. And I think it's, it's so reflective of what, like how people are in real life. You know, we'd like to think that, you know, it, we'd like to vilify people. And just be like, oh, you know, you're all bad. But yeah. especially in, you know, like Harry's relationship with his parents, especially in abusive contexts like that, part of what makes it hard is recognizing that they, there can be, you know, sweet moments in that. And it's much harder to make these decisions um, holding all of that rather than only holding the bad. It's harder to hold everything mm -hmm. and just be like, okay, well, this is what it is in its entirety. Mm -hmm. And if one doesn't forgive the other, one doesn't excuse the other, you know, like none of Harry, none of the trauma Harry has been through excuses like the crap that he does or, you know, excuses the person he ends up being. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes people ask me, like, what do I want people to take away from the novel? I hate that question. So <laughs> what I'm going to ask you instead, because um, I don't have like a preferred outcome. I'm just like, oh, take away whatever they take away from it. What I'm going to ask you instead is, if you could eavesdrop <laughs> on readers having conversations about this book, what, in your imagination, what would you like them to be talking about as you eavesdrop? Hmm, that's such a good question. I don't think I've ever found that question. What would I like them to be talking about? Um, hmm. Well, some of it I've talked about here. I'd like them to be talking about the context, you know, like the historical context of the novel. I'd like them to be talking about where the novel falls because all of art has a context and it is, context matters, politics matter, right? Um, it does a disservice to the novel if you take it out of the context in which it was created and the context for which it was created and you discuss it solely, you know, by just like, oh, this character, I like this character, I didn't like, right? So I'd like, I guess, to hear a, an in-depth conversation that is a little bit more complex and more well-rounded than just a superficial kind of conversation about like, I like this character, I didn't like this character, I like this voice, I didn't like this voice. Um, I just want to hear an in-depth, like more complex conversation about the novel um, and I'll be satisfied. It doesn't, I don't, you know, like or dislike is actually irrelevant to me. Um, what's relevant to me is how deeply you engage um, with a novel like this. It is not like, so even just any satire at all, it's too easy to read it superficially, mm -hmm. right? It's very easy to read it superficially, but you've got to look deeper 
than um, what meets the eye because there's there's more there's there's more than meets the eye with a book like this. I agree, and I think what I would like is I would like people to. Can I curse? <laughs> <laughs> I would like people to remember who the fuck Chinelo Aparenta is <laughs> when reading this book. Because like, I don't think people give you enough credit as a thinker. Like, I think that when you choose, and as we can tell from this conversation, when you choose to work in a particular form, in a particular style, you're not just bumbling blindly into it. You're doing it with a lot of rigor. Like, you teach this stuff, for God's sake. <laughs> like, you're doing this with an entire history, like, with an analysis. And this is one of my favorite things I like about Chanel, because I'm not that author. Like, I hated literature classes in school, because I was just like, the bird is perching on the tree. Maybe it's just sitting there. Why are we talking about this? <laughs> and so whenever I get to talk with her, it's like getting to talk with someone who, like, loves books in a different way than I do. I mean, I'm reading romance novels. <laughs> and I'm just like, and I think they're great. <laughs> but I think there's a, there's an intellectual rigor that you bring to the work and that you brought to this book. And, and I was so happy when I first read it because I was like, yes. Like, um, like I said before, you know, this, it, shows, it shows us like your, how incisive your mind is, you know, and it pivots away from what you've been doing and kind of hits your work from a different angle. And, and I really love this book. So thank you so much for writing it. <laughs> Everyone should get it. We're going to open for a q <laughs> Who's going first? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, come on, you have time. I'll give you like 10 minutes. Ah, yes, thank you. Hi. Hi. So fire is a really common symbol throughout the book. You have different towns are on fire and cities are on fire, and then also you have water, where Harry is a little bit, he has a lot of OCD kind of tendencies, where he's trying to wash himself, wash himself. How does that feel for you as you're putting together this story for, I guess, like, what, where that falls in Harry's story? Like, fire sort of feeling, like, chaotic, but maybe cleansing, and water having that same feel? Do you think that that fits in well with how you see Harry's voice? I'm just going to repeat the question real quick, so go at the YouTube. Uh, basically, it's how this fire, the themes of fire and water in the novel fit in with Harry, summarized. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. This is a moment where I'll be like, the bird is perching on the tree, can't <laughs> 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 um, I actually think that Thank you for noticing that, but I, and it's also, these are elements that I didn't plan, but I do think they work for the novel because Harry has this fight, right? It's the fight against like a society that is basically burning down, right? And Harry is trying to save it, so it makes sense that there would be some kind of water, right? Like pour the water, douse the fire, that sort of thing, right? Um, he builds, well, you will read the novel, but you'll find out about the burning town um, called Centralia, which is actually a, a town that's really burning, right? Like, it's it's real. Now, what happens in the town in the novel is not written, not like it's fictional, it's created, and it's created for a purpose. Um, but Harry wants to fix that town. Harry is a fixer. Harry wants to make it right, right? That's really what Harry is. Harry goes about making it right the wrong way, right, which we often do. Right? So, and, and that, that comes with his, you know, cleaning and trying to fix everything and trying to make things right. And it makes sense that the water would be what he goes to for that cleansing effect. So that, that obviously is a theme that, um, that works for the novel, although it's not clearly something that I, that I plan for it to be exactly, you know, in that, you know, one-on-one -on -one sort of um, correspondence in terms of what it's doing for the novel. I mean, it is different forms of purification, right. yeah. And I think that's actually something that Harry is trying to do mm -hmm. throughout the book, is to purify himself mm -hmm. from his parents, from mm -hmm. who he is, to come out on the other side as someone exactly. else. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Next question. Yes. Um, so, uh, you mentioned that um, Harry is empathetic, well, the reader empathizes kind of with Harry. Maybe, depending on your reading, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But I guess, I guess I wonder, um, 
what, what do you hope that achieves? Like, um, I guess if you have more people empathizing with white locals, like, what does that lead to? Like, what's maybe like the importance of that? Is there? No, just to show our humanity, that's it. Because at the end of the day, we still have to coexist, right? So the, convers uh, the, the, the novel is a conversation, right? We need to figure out what that conversation is to us and how we're going to move forward from that, you know, from what we see. The novel is satirical. The novel is an exaggeration. The novel is real, right? Like, like you said, we know these people. We know even Maryam, the Nigerian girlfriend, right? We know these people. You all know them. And actually, some of us will say that it is an exaggeration that, um, you know, like, oh, this could not possibly happen in this way. Actually, for those of us who live those microaggressions, it does feel, because some people have, well, I don't know how many people, but at least once I've heard them say, oh, again, that word, it's relentless, right? If you live it, all those microaggressions, they are relentless. I know, I lived in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania for a few years, and I, it was like in my, it was relentless. It was every moment, right? So let somebody else feel it. If, if you're a white liberal or whatever you are, and you're feeling the relentlessness of it within a novel, congratulations, it's only a novel, it's not even your life, you know? <laughs> I don't know what the solution is, I don't know the answers, but what I do know is that we have to choose to see the humanity in all of us if we're going to take the next step forward, right? So even when it's hard to see, and it is hard to see in Harry, but you can choose to see that empathy, that empathetic part of him, so that you can have that conversation, hey Harry, maybe we should, like, I see what you're trying to do, I see that you're trying to make it better, but maybe we should try this other way instead. Right, for the Harrys that we know in real life. We still need the empathy. What, what are we gonna just completely hate each other? <laughs> like then we, we won't have a society, but we need to come together if we're gonna keep moving forward. So I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna sugarcoat it. I didn't wanna pretend these things weren't happening. I didn't wanna shy away from how bad things feel, especially in the last few years. I wanted to be honest about the society we live in but I also wanted to leave a little bit of room for that humanity, for that empathy. And so I think I did, but it depends on your perspective when you enter it, right? Yeah, um, can you talk a little bit about what it was like writing Marion, like her character? Because every chapter I was like, girl, run. <laughs> and so like, what, how was it as the writer kind of like stepping into her shoes and like knowing that she kind of has to stay um, and absorb some of Carrie's carriness. Yeah, she has to stay for a while because that's what we do when we're also coming from a background that's also not um, stable, right? So Mariam has her own story that exists somewhere else and you might or might not see it if it ever gets published. <laughs> um, but uh, basically, um, you know, she, what she shares in common with Harry, and you won't know that necessarily, but you have snippets of it from the phone calls and, you know, basically what her life feels like and the energy she gives within the novel. You have snippets of basically the fact that she doesn't come from the most stable background, that she's trying to make things work as well. And so she's trying to find a community. She's an immigrant in this other country. She's trying to find comfort. She's trying to, you know, form a, I don't know, some small community that somehow feels right for her. And it makes sense that in doing that, when you're vulnerable, you stay. You know, you stay for a while until you decide this is just not right. And then you leave. And she's young, you know, like, we're not all, let's go, you know, let's, let's, let's leave right away. And if you're, you know, a little bit empathetic, you mean, whatever the word is, you want to give people the benefit of the, the doubt at first, right? You're like, he's a little strange, but let's see what this is about. Sometimes you're just interested in somebody who seems mysterious. And I'm sure Harry seems mysterious to her. Um, <laughs> uh, so it makes sense. It made sense to me as a writer that she would, um, she would stay for a while, but it also made sense that eventually she would do whatever she did. <laughs> <laughs> One more? One more question. Who will the brave soul be? Uh, yes. 
What's next? <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> That's right. <what edits>, <laughs> okay. Well, I can't talk about what you know, so I'm going to talk about something else. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So I. Oh, um. So I actually love that you mentioned. Well, first of all, I should say, obviously, you know, I love your work so much. Read, I mean, I can't keep up, so I've read almost everything. <laughs> I can't say I've read everything. There's one I haven't read yet. Um, but everything else I have read, and I love your most recent romance novel, um, which I devoured in like two seconds, really. Um, so I, 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 before that, I was writing this um, novel that is it's basically a romance without any sex. <laughs> so that's, so that's, we'll take it. <laughs> but it's really romantic, you guys. <laughs> so that's it. It's, it's not done yet. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm making her so nervous. She's like, why do you keep doing weird things? <laughs> bringing, bringing everybody over to the genres. <laughs> Lots of succeeding. <laughs> um, I think we're good on time. Thank you all so much for coming out to be a part of this. Chanela will be personalizing signed books afterwards, um, and someone else will tell you where that is. <laughs> I know. Yeah, you can find all copies of everyone's books up front at the register. And thank you both so much, Chinello and Akweke. This was such a lovely conversation. Harry Sylvester Bird came out this week, so you can buy your copies right up front and get them personalized afterwards. Thank you all so much.